shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. That little, that little video puts me in the mood for Jesus, so I'm not sure about you. The live service, I kind of came up doing a little bit of this. I don't know why I was, but I kind of get fired up about certain things, and I hope Jesus is the number one thing. So, hey, welcome to church this weekend. Um, I want to give a shout out to the mothers again in the house. Mothers, bless you, bless you, bless you. Amen. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Um, and just again, just uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, may you know his joy May you know, hey, hey, moms, may you know how much he loves you. I mean, really, when it comes down to it, I hope you're shower with love today uh, in an earthly sense, but I pray that you will know the love of God from a heavenly sense, because really, when it comes down to it, it's all you need. And if you got him, you're good, all right? If you got Christ, you're good. Grace and mercy and joy upon you this day. Uh, may it be so. I'm just going to pray for our time right now and pray for our moms a little bit. And, uh, and then we'll get into the word of God. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thank you for your faithfulness, God. You're so faithful. Just declare love for you, the joy that we desire to have in you, the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, filling us, living in us. Particularly, Lord, this day, we just thank you for the moms represented here. Uh, the moms, Lord, who we know are not perfect, but I pray are children of God and therefore so greatly loved, so perfectly loved by you. And I pray, Lord, cherished by us. And that there'd be such a sense of gratitude, Lord, and, and just that you would bring peace and love upon uh, each home represented here, Lord. And then all the different women that have such an impact upon this church family, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, Lord, may they be so encouraged by you and in you. If you do it, Lord, it's perfect. And so I pray that will take place. Uh, this day. Help us now to minds just so engaged and hearts stirred by the word of God, which we now open up and begin to go through verse by verse again. I pray for your glory. Capture us as only you can by your spirit, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Isaiah chapter 11. Please find a Bible and open it to Isaiah chapter 11, which is pretty near the middle of your Bible. And you find the book of Isaiah, and we turn to chapter 11. We'll be looking at the first nine verses together, second week in our captured series. Last week we began in Isaiah chapter 9, and we were looking to be captured by the hope of glory. If you are here, you will recall in Isaiah chapter 9 these profound passages speaking of the glories of that are only revealed in Jesus Christ. The passage says those who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness on them has light shined. And then it went on to prophesy the birth of the Messiah. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God and Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And it says this too in that text. It says, and the increase of his government and of peace. It's so great. There will be no end. There will be no end to the increase of his government and of peace. So we're so you can be captured by the hope of the glory that is found and revealed in Jesus Christ the Messiah, and today then, Isaiah chapter 11 is a wonderful follow-up from Isaiah 9, just a, a carryover. If Isaiah 9 is declaring the birth that is found in the Messiah, well then Isaiah 11 is unpacking the kingdom of, that will be established by the Messiah as he comes and lives, and even a look ahead to when he returns again as he seeks to reign and taking all that is his and the beauty and the glory to see the power that is established by this one and only so this week I was really blessed by a certain quote I heard. It turns out it's by Malcolm Muggeridge. And he said this, and this is really the context of where we are in Isaiah. He says, the more I look at the Savior, small s, the more I look at the saviors of men, the more beautiful the Lamb of God looks to me. Think about that. The more I look at 
the reality and the emptiness of this world, the more I see our entertainment obsessed culture, the idolatry that is rampant everywhere, the more I really look at what the world says saves. Really, that, that, him, whatever, that item, that device, that, my, I mean, the more I really look at the saviors of men, and then you turn and look to Jesus Christ, the more astoundingly beautiful he becomes to me and to us. That is the point of the series. This is what we're praying God would do. Capture us, Lord, not with temporary, trivial, bleh. Capture us with you, Jesus Christ, because then and only then will we be truly satisfied. Some of you are here today and you're longing for that satisfaction. You've never found it because you have yet to turn to Jesus Christ. When you turn to him, life will not be easier, but it will be so much better. And you will begin to understand why you live, why the purpose of your life and your existence, you will hear today through the life, through the death, through the resurrection, through the power of Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit, capital S, and the Spirit of the Lord, all caps, Lord, Yahweh. And the Spirit of the Lord of Yahweh shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Check this out. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. What's the weapon of the Messiah? His words. He doesn't need anything else. He just speaks and it happens. We'll get to that in a few moments. I'm pretty excited about that. Righteousness shall be the belt of his ways and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, the little child shall lead them beautiful. The cow and the bear shall graze, the young shall lie down together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, the nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Check this out. As the waters cover the sea. Here we go in today's text. He can be captured by his power. Therefore, I have four points of power or four power points. Power point number one is this. Loved ones, don't ever underestimate his power to bear fruit. Don't ever underestimate the power of the chosen one, the anointed one, Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Lord of the universe. Don't ever underestimate his power to bear fruit. Verse 1, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. The imagery of verse 1 has always captured me. It is including to capture me today as I go through it again for the third time this weekend. The imagery is that of a tree that has been cut down. A tree, therefore, that was once strong has now been reduced to a stump. But notice, this isn't just any old stump. The Bible tells us it's the stump of Jesse, who was Jesse. Jesse was the father, of course, of David meaning that this is in the line or the royal line of the house of David. Let's remember our context from Isaiah 9 from last week too. The Assyrian army was being predicted and promised that they would devastate God's people. They were coming to cut down the tree, so to speak, reducing it to a stump of Jesse. But in chapter 10, verse 34, we see the promise of the destruction of Assyria itself. And this prophecy is made through the imagery of a forest being cut down as well. So between Isaiah chapter 10 verse 34 and Isaiah 11 verse 1, we have both the Assyrian army or the nation of Assyria and the house of David or Jesse being cut down. But here's the key difference. Assyria will be cut down to never grow again in the same way. But the stump of Jesse has been reduced to that, but it is about to give way to new life that has never been seen before. So you need to understand that the line of David is proving to be more and more of a disappointment. David as king did a lot of things really, really well. 
and he was a man after God's own heart, the Bible tells us, and he had established a kingdom that was so powerful, his son Solomon took over despite some of David's failings, and Solomon was used to take it to a, a level that God's people had never seen in terms of riches, of power, of influence, of favor of God that spread really to the common world as wide as they possibly could. But Solomon messed up. And Solomon gave his life to foreign women and got distracted from his purpose that God said, if you do this, you'll be blessed. If you do this, you will not be blessed. And Solomon went downhill and everyone after him, including uh, who followed his son and Rehoboam and everyone else after every king was like one disaster after another. And this is what we're seeing right here as we turn to Isaiah chapter 11 that their sin was so much, God's like, I'm reducing you to a stump. But notice this. In the midst of the downfall, in the midst of the hardship, in the midst of the trial that they themselves brought on themselves, Isaiah gives hope in verse 1. Isaiah says, yeah, you're a stump, but from this stump will come a, a shoot. And in the shoot, there will be a branch. Now, here's a timeout right now for some application. Notice this again embedded in God's word. Loved ones, do not put your hope in man. Do not trust in David. Do not put your hope in Solomon. Do not put your hope in Rehoboam. Put your hope in the only one who can't fail you. Do not be captured by man. Be captured by Christ. Do not look for people. If you look to this world to satisfy you, you will be let down every single time. Whether your mom or your dad or some other leader or some pastor or whoever, they are human. They are sinners. There was one who had no sin. He's the Messiah. He's Jesus Christ. He's the one we speak of now. He's the only one who cannot fail you ever. And Isaiah's getting to this. Isaiah's like, in chapter 9, Isaiah was like, I'm announcing this Messiah with his birth. And now, again, in Isaiah 11, now we see what his kingdom looks like as it unfolds upon this earth again. Notice in verse 1 that a tiny little shoot will emerge from the stump, and from the shoot will then grow a branch. And this branch will be sturdy and healthy. How do we know? Because behind the word branch means greenness or striking color. And furthermore, because verse 1 tells us that it shall bear fruit. So don't miss how profound this text is. You see, just when the enemy thought they had won, there's, there's David's kingdom. It's dwindling and God's plan isn't working and Satan and his demons are tasting victory and seeing this in their sights. And again, as David's throne is becoming, again, little and little and seemingly lost, then out of a cut-down tree, a stump remains. And from the stump is a little shoot. And from the shoot is a, a branch. Now, if you're walking by this stump and you're just like, look at that stump, it's, it's pathetic, this little stump there. It's got a nice try tree. It's, it's over. And then you see you walk by and you see all oh, this little, a little shoot from this stump. And you're like, yeah, that's also, it's, it, what are you going to do, little, little shoot? Are you going to grow up into a tree or, or something like that? And you walk by and you see a branch there from this stump shoot and a branch. And you're just like, yeah, you're, so, you're, so, you're so small. You're, you're so nothing. And, and yet it's exactly the plan of God to save the world from their sins. It's what the Lord... Now, I'm a visual person, so I've got to get some visual stuff on the screen here. So let's do that. Let's get a picture of a stump here, all right? So here's a picture of a, a tree that has been cut down. I, I, I pray you'll never look at Isaiah 11, verse 1 again, ever in your life. I pray you will always look at this and make a note somewhere to understand what this is talking about. This is awesome. When you get this, how God works... Remember, from this stump, there goes Israel. All oh, they're nothing now, man. It's over. Assyria's going to, everything's going to take over. But then all of a sudden, there's a little shoot that emerges. And this little shoot came in the form of a baby in Bethlehem. In complete and utter poverty, in obscurity, and the vast, vast majority of the entire world had no idea what was going on. And this little shoot forms this branch. And most people will mock and despise it and say it's nothing. But listen, in the plan of God, from this cut down stump of Jesse, forms a shoot and a branch. Listen, and in this branch, this branch holds infinite power. This branch will, will be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And this branch, ultimately, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that this branch, Jesus, is Lord. That is awesome. See, loved ones, what you have to understand as you approach this text today, when the world says it's done and it's over, listen, God, this is the principle right now, God specializes in the comeback. God loves the underdog. God is the one, yeah, you can tell me I'm done, and God's like, I'm just getting started. 
They look at the stump, they mock it. They look at the shoot, they mock it. They look at the branch, they mock it. And yet this branch would be the savior of the entire universe. Do you see how humble our God is? See how humble our savior is? The shoot, the branch, seemingly nothing, becomes the savior again of the world. Not fire from heaven, not a conquering army, a branch, a baby, the light of the world, the door to heaven, the way, the truth, and the life. You can take this principle to your life. Just when you think the stump is dead, bam, here comes the shoot. Just when you think the savior is dead, bam, here comes Easter Sunday. Just when you think all hope is lost for your life, and you sit before the Lord weeping, listen, bam, he bears fruit. I've said this before and I'll say it again. You think the Lord is done with you in your life? Don't ever, ever underestimate the truth and the fruit that Jesus Christ can give in your life. Don't ever underestimate his power to bear fruit through your life. Again, you think he's done with you? You think he's done? He's not done with you. Are you still breathing? He's not done with you. You think he's, he's, he's ceased to see fruit in your life? Yeah, but I'm so discouraged. I'm so, uh, I'm so hopeless. Listen, you look to the Lord and you trust in him and you see what God will do in your life as you surrender in your darkest, hardest moments to what God can do through a life that trusts in him. Loved ones, don't ever, ever underestimate his power to bear fruit in your life. Why? Because God specializes in the comeback. And a lot of you have been written off. A lot of you may feel like a, a cut down tree and a stump right now. But because of Jesus Christ, the original shoot and branch that formed into our salvation, the things that the Lord can do through your life, oh God, may it be seen, don't ever underestimate the power of Jesus Christ to bear fruit in your life, in this church, in this world. You can't be stopped. And the more you're captured by this truth, the more you believe in this truth in your life as well. PowerPoint number one, don't underestimate his power to bear fruit. PowerPoint number two, don't ever underestimate his power, listen, to rule. His power to rule. He's that great. Look at verse 2. Verse 2 says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Let's stop right there. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Again, the, the, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Yahweh. This means then the Holy Spirit of God will permanently and perfectly dwell within the Messiah. In Colossians chapter 1, it says this about Jesus Christ. In him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Think about that. In Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in this shoot, in this branch, in the Messiah. It was Jesus himself when he began his preaching ministry. He unrolled the scroll of Isaiah of all books and he was in Isaiah 61. We'll get to that in a few weeks, Lord willing. And it was in Luke chapter 4, it tells us, he reads as he begins his ministry, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. There's no one else who can boast of such a thing in this way. There is no branch like him. There is no fruit that has been seen like this before. And consider now the fruit of the Holy Spirit that will bring through this branch. Again, And verse 2, verse 2, here's the fruit. The spirit of wisdom, understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So the qualities of the anointed one will carry the obvious fact that he is truly and fully anointed. No leader can boast either before or after Jesus Christ because the one who boasts of such things are only found where God is fully present. Just think about that. Your Savior, the fullness of God, dwelled within him when he's on earth and continues, of course, forever and ever and ever has eternally existed in this way. This is why we follow Jesus Christ, because he's the greatest, because he is God, because he's awesome, because he is perfect. See, as you get captured by him, you follow him. A.W. Tozer said this, and I've always loved this quote. He says, listen to the man with oil on his forehead. Or follow the man who follows God. Or listen to the man who listens to God. Jesus Christ is the perfect example of the individual who had perfectly oil on his forehead. Oil, of course, symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ fully, again, the Holy Spirit dwelling in him perfectly. Which means then, everything he says, loved ones, do it, do it, do it. Whatever Jesus says, do it. Because he's following God. And he has oil on his forehead to perfection. He, all the fullness of God dwells in him. So whatever he says to do, just do it. Everywhere he goes, follow him. Everywhere. 
He'll never lead you astray. Everywhere he goes, follow Jesus Christ. And listen, that means everything he does succeeds. Everything. Everything he does, Jesus Christ does. He succeeds in everything. And so this Savior, this Messiah, he will come with wisdom and understanding. A wisdom and understanding that cannot be thwarted. I love now in the gospel stories, we begin to see the fulfillment of this prophecy uh, come to light and and start to be fulfilled and i love when jesus and his wisdom and understanding when he encounters the pharisees remember all those stories and i kind of get a chuckle when jesus is up against the pharisees and the pharisees all gathered together let's trick him let's trick him let's trick him and they go let's ask him a question about john the baptist let's ask him a question about if he paid taxes let's ask him a question if he should stone this woman and every time they go oh, we got him now we got him now but they fail to realize they're dealing with absolutely perfect wisdom and understanding from God himself. Good luck with that one, right? But they try to catch him, and then in the end, Jesus just confronts them and usually responds with a question they cannot answer themselves, and they go away, and they're so mad and exasperated, all they can do now is, let's kill him, let's kill him, because they hate him, because they're jealous of him, because they want to be him, because they can't stand to let anyone else become better than them, and so their only response is, let's kill him. Why? Ultimately, because Jesus is just that smart. He's so smart. He possesses infinite and perfect wisdom and understanding. It's prophesied right here in Isaiah 11, verse 2. He will come also this with counsel and might. I love when Jesus finishes teaching the Sermon on the Mount, the crowds are astonished. Elsewhere in Scripture, they marvel. They are astounded. Their jaws are dropped open because they're hearing these things. We've never heard this type of authority before because he comes with wisdom, understanding, with counsel, and with might. One of my favorite gospel stories is when Jesus calms the storm. Depending on which account you're reading the gospels, remember Jesus is sleeping and the disciples are in the boat and the wind and the waves come. The disciples are all freaking out and they're all afraid and they're terrified. Jesus wakes up and he's like, dude, chill. My paraphrase, all right? But he says that. He's like, listen, relax, relax, man. Like, what are you so afraid of? Are you little faith, right? And he's like, I got this. Again, my paraphrase. But I, I got this. And then he, he gives counsel to the wind and the waves. And his counsel is, stop. And then in his might, in his might, the wind and the waves, they actually stop. I love telling my kids a story. And I go, at that point, kids, everything went, and everything went calm. And then the disciples, the disciples, man, they crack me up. They're the best. They're in the boat. And they're like, what kind of man is this? Who even the wind and the, and the, and the seas obey him? I, I'd be with them. I'm like, what kind of man is this? Who can tell the wind to stop and it stops? Who can tell the seas to stop roaring and they stop? Who can do? What kind of man is this? The man who's awesome. The man who is the son of God in the flesh. The one who is a, a prophesied 700 years before by Isaiah that he would come in the spirit of God with counsel and might. And he will come with the might, listen, this is so great, that cannot be discouraged or weakened. See, again, when you follow Christ, when you're captured by Christ, part of what you're captured by is he can't lose. He can't give up. He can't be weakened. He can't be diminished. He can't fail you. There's no one else you can look to in this world who can give you that kind of promise. No one other than Jesus Christ. And the more that you look to him, you're like, man, like truly... He's the man. He's the one and only. Because he comes with counsel and might. I love the story too. Jesus on Good Friday, he is dying on the cross and, and, and dies. And the Roman centurion is standing beside him, the gospels say. And, and the Roman centurion observes the earth quaking and the rock splitting and the darkness comes over the whole land. And filled with awe, the Bible says, the Roman centurion looks and says, truly, this man was the son of God. He is so captured in that moment by the counsel and the might that is found in the Messiah alone, Jesus Christ. Isaiah tells us too that he will come with spirit, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So this means that Jesus will carry with him a zeal and a passion for the Lord's work that is un paralleled he will be so passionate about the father's work in the fear of the lord again we think of jesus often as meek and mild which is which is true and great and sometimes we treat him like a teddy bear oh, come here jesus let me kind of give you a snuggle which it depends it depends and he's love yes he's mercy yes he's compassionate yes he's so kind yes he's forgiving of course of course but he's also the same Savior who walked into his father's house and saw it being a den of robbers and started flipping over tables. Again, the disciples, 
<laughs> the disciples. The disciples are, what's going to happen today, man? And they're walking with Jesus, and oh, he's going to the he's going to pray in the temple. And they're walking in, and Jesus goes, boom, and just starts turning stuff over in his perfect, righteous anger. I mean, again, the boys must have just been like, well, this, this is not a boring life, and here we are following Jesus, and he's turning over tables and saying, how dare you make my father's house, supposed to be a house of prayer, into a den of robbers, turning over tables. And the disciples, what do they say in the Gospel of John? The disciples remember the verse in the Psalms that says, zeal for your house will consume me. You see, Jesus Christ, yeah, he's meek and mild, but man, he's come to do what he's come to do. He is awesome. He comes in the knowledge, the spirit of the knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. He's so passionately pursuing the work and the will of his Father, and nothing will stop him. Don't ever underestimate, listen, his power to rule. Don't ever underestimate Jesus Christ. And the more you gaze upon him, the more you are sure that this is true. The Thursday before Jesus died, he was in the upper room with his disciples. He was predicting they would fail him. He was predicting they would scatter. He was predicting they would run away. Here's what Jesus says in John 16, verse 32. He says, Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it is come, when you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone. See, he's, again, he's predicting that they will leave him at his kind of moment of most need. He goes, Yet I'm not alone, for the Father is with me. And I have said these things to you that in me, in me, you may have peace, peace. And this is for some right here today. This is for many here today. Like I feel like I, I failed the Lord. I'm not, I'm not adding up to the Lord. I'm not, you know, listen, you have to imagine that God is never looking at you, waving his finger, going, wow, you stink, okay? God is never, ever doing that. The whole point of sending his son, his son was going to do it all. See, we respond in love to Jesus Christ because we have been loved so much. You can't earn a better favor or status with God. You trust in the work that his son has done, not the work that you and I have done. And Jesus looks at him, he's like, I know you're gonna fail me. We fail him all the time. But he says, I know it's gonna happen, but you find peace in me. In the world, you will have tribulation. He says, but take heart. But take heart, I have overcome. I have overcome the world. You see, you see when you stare and you are captured by Jesus Christ, what you hear him saying, he says you by name right now. He calls you by name today, 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 today. Here, here now. He calls you by name. He says you can fear, and you can worry, and you can stress, and you can agonize, and you can, he says, or you can understand that if you belong to me, you win. He says to you today, he says, my child, hey, 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 look right here. This is, I mean, this, this is true. Look right here. Jesus says to you today, he's like, I've won. And if you're a part of his team, if you belong to his family, listen, you win too. Understand this too. Ready? Ready again. If you're on the team of Jesus Christ, you're his. And if you're his, you're good. You're good. Like, it's, it's just going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. You're like, really? I'm like, really? Why? Because Jesus says, I have overcome the world. But the world's so scary. Jesus is like, I've overcome the world. <laughs> right? Yeah, but I don't know what's going to Jesus is like, I've I've won. I've won. Yeah, yeah, but I'm so afraid. Yeah, I've won. Child, how many times do I got to say it, man? It's done. Take heart. I have overcome the world. If you look at Jesus and you see that, fear runs. Disappointment runs. Anxiety runs. Hurt begins to be released. When you look upon Jesus Christ and you say and you hear he has overcome the world and you hear that to you, it's like everything else we hold on to. There's nothing that can overcome or trump the truth that Jesus says. Don't ever underestimate his power to rule. Don't ever. There's no one like him. But we have to look to him more to hear this and to know this in our lives. Not just with words, but with actual living. I'm not going to underestimate him anymore. That's where, because he's awesome. All prophesied 700 years before he was born. Now here we are 2,000 years later. I pray living out the same truth. PowerPoint number three. Don't ever underestimate the power of his righteousness. His righteousness. So verse three, it says this. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. So notice verse three reinforces the end of verse 2. Verse 2, it says, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Verse 3, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. The key word there is delight. The word delight is taken from the noun sent, S-C-E-N-T. The verb to smell a pleasing odor 
over time came to mean to delight in. The lighting and the smell of a certain fragrance. Question, loved ones, what's a smell that you delight in? What's one of your favorite smells? So I took a survey among our staff this week, and here's some of the answers I got back here from this favorite smell list. Someone said vanilla. That's a good one. Someone said citrus. Someone said lavender. I think one of, one of our team members, they were asked this question, and the person asking them actually has a connection to a scented candle company, so they thought that they were asking the question relating to scented candles, so his response was fruity ginger peach pineapple. So, <laughs> that's amazing. Anyways, someone else said um, fresh cut grass, uh, to each his own. Yeah, not really sure about that one, but anyways, okay. Uh, someone said autumn leaves. Someone said cinnamon. Someone else said the ocean. Someone said a fireplace burning on a cold night. Hmm. Someone said walking into a house to the smell of roast beef cooking. <laughs> yeah, that got the biggest reaction all weekend. Some guy on staff said my wife. I'll let you guess who that is. Yeah. And of course, any Christian survey must include this answer, walking into Swiss chalet. Yeah. <laughs> I got a little bit hungry. Did you get a little bit hungry just there? Just there? Hey, we love the smell of certain things, but listen, listen, the Messiah, he delights in the fragrance of the fear of the Lord. He delights in the fragrance of his Father being revered and honored. What an image that is. I wonder, I wonder, what aroma is lifting up from us today to the Lord? I wonder, I wonder. Is, is, are his nostrils being filled with the fragrance of reverence and worship as we sing, as right now, as we study, as we pray, as we seek to learn and to grow? Is there a fragrance of the fear of the Lord? Or is there a fragrance of self and world and sin? I, oh God, may it be though that more and more the fragrance of the fear of the Lord is coming from our lives. Understand this, how do I know if I'm growing in Jesus Christ? One of the greatest ways you know you're growing in Jesus Christ is you become like Jesus Christ. And one of the ways we know today that we become like Jesus Christ is when more and more we delight, we truly delight in his glory from our lives more than we delight in self. So the more you and I are getting true pleasure, not just saying it, but actually delighting and becoming less that he might become more, the more we are growing in the knowledge of the fear of the Lord from our lives and we delight in that that we know we're becoming more like Jesus Christ. Some of you right now are like, oh man, I'm not doing well. Listen, listen, but your day's not done yet, remember? Don't ever underestimate his power to bear fruit in your life. You can get to the place increasingly where you are actually delighting more when he gets glory than when you do. He must increase and I must decrease. See, that's an exciting little examination to take. He delights in the fragrance of the fear of the Lord. And again, look at verse three. It says here, it says, he goes on, he shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Now, what's happening here is this. The Messiah has the ability to distinguish between appearance and reality. You and I, we judge by what we hear, we judge by what we see. And have you figured out this yet? Often we're wrong. More often than not, we judge people prematurely, and then we find out later that we're wrong. Have you, have you learned to be cautious yet when you seek to judge someone's heart and intentions? Have you learned yet from your own failures that it's probably not a good idea to try to play God over someone's life? I hope so. Because we feel pretty foolish when in the end we're like, wow, I totally got you wrong, and I labeled you as this, this, and this, and I totally wrote you off, and I thought you were, and all of a sudden you realize, man, what? What does that say about us? But all that to say, that never happens with the Messiah. He judges with righteousness, it says here in verse 4. With righteousness, he will judge. And then notice also in verse 4, the reference to the poor and the meek of the earth. What does that mean? Jesus is all about justice. He doesn't favor the rich. He doesn't favor the strong. Jesus is, again, completely about fairness. He doesn't show favoritism. He is about justice. Some of you have suffered, you believe, uh, being a victim of injustice. Some of you are in that place right now. Uh, I think all of us in the future at some point will go through a process where we feel like we are victims of injustice. What you have to understand is, listen, God sees that, and there will come a time where God will make every wrong right. 
Jesus Christ being the righteous judge, he will. He says, vengeance is mine. Jesus Christ will come. That's what it's saying to us right now. You have to take stock. You have to take courage. in the wrong you feel right now, when it's all said and done, he will make it right. He will. He sees. God says, give it to me. One of the things that what happens to us, we become so impatient. And we want everything to happen today, today, today. But Jesus tells us, live for what will be and let what will be change your today. Put your faith in the world to come. Put your faith in heaven. Put your faith in the reality that all things will be made new and right and sin will be eradicated. And let your faith in the future impact your present world today, here and now. But we're not so good at that. We want here and now to be changed by the way we want it to be done. Every single Jesus like, but faith requires you trust in me. And with righteousness, with righteousness he shall judge. And verse 4 gets pretty serious. See verse 4? The phrases here that are so key. The rod of his mouth he will strike the earth. With the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Rod of his mouth, breath of his lips. One commentator says this. The king needs no other display of power and no other weapon of enforcement than the bare word that he speaks. Amazing. So the word breath here in the text is a powerful, invisible force. So this is so amazing. Whatever Jesus says, does. Can you imagine having that kind of authority and power? He speaks, and it happens. Let's try that, okay? Let's try that right now. So I want to say today that it will never, ever again snow in the town of Oakville. Yeah, some of you are like, no, no, I like winter, I like winter. Well, then you can move somewhere else, all right? <laughs> now, now, that's not going to work, is it? No, that's not going to work at all. But if Jesus said it, it would. You know, in, in the Gospels, he's walking by the fig tree, and he curses the fig tree, and it withers. And his, dis his disciples, the disciples again, they're walking behind him. They're like, did you, did you just see that? Like, he just, he cursed the tree and it withered before the rest. What kind of man is this? What kind of, who can do that? And he's walking along, he cursed the fig tree and it withers as soon as he says it. That's awesome. Listen, that is child's play compared to what he will do when he returns for the second time. But it says right here, he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. He will kill the wicked with the breath of his lips. You know, Revelation 19 tells us that in righteousness, he judges and makes war. See, don't ever underestimate his righteousness. He will make it right. He will make it right. In righteousness, he judges. And it also says in Revelation 19, from his mouth comes a sharp sword. From his mouth comes a sharp sword to strike the nations. We hear so much about Armageddon and the final battle and stuff like that. There's this big struggle between good and evil. I mean, I hate to break it to you, but it's a pretty, pretty easy victory for Jesus, all right? So Satan gathers all his people, and they all try to come against Jesus, and Jesus just says the word, and it's over. Like, so don't get too comfy in your seat. Don't go for popcorn. It's going to be over really fast, all right? He's going to say one word, and it's done. It's just done. He speaks, and it's over. And it's over. Why? He's awesome. Because you can never underestimate the power of his righteousness, the power of his ability to bear free, the power of his rule. You can never underestimate his ability to do whatever he says he's going to do. Hey, can he do it? Yes, uh, yes, he can. Can Jesus do it? Only, only Jesus can. He's that great. See, when you look to him, loved ones, and some of you right now, hey, listen, this is happening right now. As this message is being preached, a lot of you are stopping to look. At, you're, you're not looking at the world. You're looking at Jesus, and all of a sudden, you're starting to feel something a little bit different going on inside of you. What's happening there? The Bible's happening there. The truth of Jesus Christ is that you're like, wait a second, that's true. I am gazing upon myself and the world. And wait, I am looking at Jesus and I am feeling different and I am thinking different and I am discovering there's hope and I am realizing there's so much joy for me and I do believe that Jesus is awesome and wow, it's changing me from the inside. Duh. That's what he does. And so the challenge and the invitation is do it every day. Do it every day. Robbie, Robbie, do it every day. To believe in the glory that is found in Jesus Christ, never underestimating who he is and what he's done. Don't ever underestimate the power of his righteousness. And finally, PowerPoint number four is don't ever underestimate the power of his peace. The power of his peace. Look at verse six now. Verse six says, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion, and the fattened calf together, and the little child shall lead them. 
The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, the nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra. Then the weaned child, amazing, shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, the imagery that is presented here in these verses have captured thinkers and artists for centuries. There's a lot of debate that occurs. Is this literal? Will this literally happen? Or is this symbolic? The answer is, I don't know. Okay? But what I do know is this, and what encourages me the most as I read verses 6 to 9 is this. What encourages me the most is the power of the peace that Jesus Christ will usher in in his second return. It's, it's incredible to me. It's not the peace, but the power of his peace to establish that he brings forth when he comes. Remember, verses 6 to 9 recall the promise and the establish of Eden. It recalls when the earth was first formed and the harmony where there was no sin and things had not ruined the earth. It's, it's, it's making us think back upon that. Verses 6 to 9 then are foretelling the time when all of creation comes back together in harmony where perfect peace rules. Imagine that. Be captured by that moment where perfect peace, new heavens, new earth, maybe millennial reign. That can be debated as well. But regardless, the, the, the perfection of peace of Christ on earth. You know, Romans 8 tells us that the creation itself we live in now groans for full restoration. It groans. That's why uh, earthquakes happen. That's why disasters occur. That's why we see even evidences of sin in our world. When you see a dandelion all right, on the ground, I hate weeds, right? That is a sign of sin, and it's also the world groaning to be restored to its intended, perfected state as created by God. But the Bible also says in Romans 8 that we groan inwardly, that we groan to be restored, that we groan to be made new and right and whole in Jesus Christ. So this week, maybe you're like me, this week I groan physically. Anyone else? I've grown physically this week, man. I'm not getting any younger, let me just say that, all right? Some of you are like, oh, please. No, you will, please, all right? <laughs> so, I'm joking, I'm joking. Some of us, i grown this week emotionally. Emotionally, some tough times this week. Anyone else grow emotionally this week? Thank you for your honesty. And I've grown spiritually this week, too. I've grown spiritually this week, and just even today, and even right now, because why? Because I'm not made for this world. I'm not made for here and now. This is, not, this is not my end game. And if you're in Christ, this isn't your end game either. You are made for something so much greater, so much better, so much more glorious. That's the point, loved ones. That's the point. That's what's being said even right here. We long for the day when the wolf and the lamb graze there. We long for the day with a child. There's no fear. Our child can't die. Our child can't get hurt. We long for the day where peace is perfectly and powerfully established by Jesus Christ when he returns. And just, I mean, just... Do yourself a favor. Just, just stop long enough, even now, to imagine that day. Just be captured by the thought. I mean, you want to close your eyes? Whatever you want to do, just, just, just take a moment to imagine the power of the peace that Jesus Christ will usher in when he returns. Just, just, just imagine a world without fear or worry. Imagine an earth without hate or jealousy. Imagine the earth without bitterness or violence. Imagine a, a world without slander or pride or self-obsession or sexual immorality or blasphemy or selfishness. Just imagine, be captured by the thought of a world without sin. That's the power of the peace of Jesus Christ. Don't ever underestimate his power for peace. You see, this world we live in, man, it's messed up. It's messed up. But within this messed up world, Jesus Christ has come to bring eternal life. And even today, Jesus Christ offers through the gift of his gospel, the gift of his life, his death, his resurrection. Listen, he offers to you, you're here right now, he offers to you eternal life. You're like, how do I get this? By going to church? No. By being a good person? No. By saying prayers? No. By reading my Bible? No. By doing good deeds somewhere? My, no. No, 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 no. You don't get eternal life by something you do. You get eternal life by believing in what has been done. 
Jesus Christ has done it all. He has paid for your sins on the cross, and you are forgiven if you accept this gift by faith, by faith, by faith. Grace is the gift of God. And what happens is when you are saved in Jesus Christ, the penalty of sin is no longer on your life. Before Christ, you are guilty, and you should be guilty because we all have sinned. But in Jesus Christ, when you love him and believe in him, he takes your sin, puts it on himself, and you get his righteousness. The penalty of sin, God no longer sees you as guilty, he sees you as innocent. Why? Because you have trusted in the work of his son. You have trusted for the forgiveness of your sins in Jesus Christ. So the penalty of sin is now no longer there. And as you begin now to walk in freedom, from the penalty of sin, you begin to see the power of sin diminished in your life. It's called sanctification, a big word for becoming more like Jesus. You walk the path of sanctification, and as you grow more like Jesus Christ, the power of sin begins to be weakened in your life. Hopefully, we are all encountering that on some level. We're saved in Jesus Christ. We begin to walk, and the power of sin, again, is lessened. But what still remains, though, in this time in this world is the presence of sin. The presence of sin is still with us, and that's what messes up our world so much. But see, this is why even though the penalty has been dealt with and the power of sin is being weakened, we long ultimately for when the presence of sin is forever dealt with and defeated. That's at the return of Christ. That's what's being expressed right here in Isaiah 11, verses 69, and that's what we long for. Imagine the power of the peace of Jesus Christ when he comes to deal once and for all with the very, very presence of sin that is forever gone. Yes, Lord. Please, Lord, I mean, are you, are you as sick of your heart as I am with mine? I'm so sick of my sin. I can't take it anymore. I'm so tired of my own self-destruction every day. But I look to Christ and I see hope. And I think of the power of his peace. Awesome. Please, Lord. That's why we live. Today you're looking for hope. It's Jesus Christ. You're looking for peace, it's Jesus Christ. Looking for power, it's Jesus Christ. Looking for the reason you live, it's Jesus Christ. Looking for your purpose, it's Jesus Christ. Looking for the reason you exist, Jesus Christ. Looking for true joy and satisfaction, it's Jesus Christ. Don't ever underestimate his power for peace, for fruit, for righteousness, for rule within your life. Loved ones, can he do it? Ah, uh, yeah, Jesus can. Anyone else? No. Can Jesus? Only Jesus can do it. Can he do it? Yes, he can can. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. Jesus Christ, you are so powerful. You are so powerful. And you say, Lord, you say you are making all things new. I pray even today, Lord, even today, you are renewing us in mind to allow us to see why we live, allowing us to see the power you behold, allowing us to see, Lord, how awesome and how great you are. Oh, God, may that be so. May that be so, Lord. God, may we not be captured by things around us, May we be captured by the God above us, but the God who loves us. Oh, loved ones, he loves you today. He loves you. He loves you. He speaks to you. He calls to you. He says, see me, my child. See me. I cannot, I cannot be beaten. See me, my child. I cannot lose. I can't lose. I'm forever victorious. I will never be defeated, ever, ever. And he says, my child, you're on my team. You're on my team. You belong in my family. You are in my wallet. I have a photo of you in my wallet, God says. And I've got you. But now, child, respond in reality that I have you and that I love you. Sing in such a way, child, that you know I can. That you know I'm the only one who can. I have, I am, and I will. Sing, my child. Live, my child, in such a way that you will prove that I'm in charge, that I have won, and you have reason to live. Lord, you can do it, and you alone can do it. We bless you now. In Jesus' name, let's stand together.